I'm back. Welcome to the Just Baseball Show. It is Wednesday, May 29th. That's Arm Late, and I'm Peter Apple. And damn it, Arm, I'm excited to talk some baseball with you. We're going to talk about Angel Hernandez retiring. We are going to talk about Corbin Carroll and the great article that you wrote on JustBaseball.com. You're going to walk us through some of the problems that have come up this season illustrating his struggles and then what he can do to improve. We're also going to do a check-in on BetMGM World Series odds, and I have a long shot one that I want to pitch to Aram and the listeners of the Just Baseball Show, and we're going to end it with Aram's famous prospect report. Aram, it's so good to be back. What's up, dude? Uh, welcome back. I, I think if you stayed a couple extra days, you, you could have met Angel Hernandez down there in Cancun. Um, I, how was it? How was the trip? You look like you got some good color. You looking like you feel refreshed. Oh, I'm 100%. Well, right now I'm pretty tired. I'm not going to lie to you because yeah. it was a whirlwind of a weekend. But overall, my mental feels good, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. My body is tired and my body is red. You know, most people, they go down to Cancun or a tropical place and they might get a nice tan. I just get as red as humanly possible. And yeah, people make fun of, you know, my last name is Apple, Red Apple. Oh, I, I didn't a, think about that. I have an enormous head, right? <laughs> I was telling a story that in Little League, when I was 11, you know, when everybody orders the hats, I had to order the coaches sized hats. And then when I got my Phillies hat at Citizens Bank Park, you know they, how they have the huge wall of fitted hats. They had to go to the back to find my size. Remember, this is a playoff game. They're supposed to be servicing everybody. They had to go to the back and they're like, we have one more. Here you go. And I'm like, we've been stretching this one out with a watermelon. (laughs) And it was a little little bit tight. I'm not going to lie to you. It was a little bit tight. (laughs) But so I have a large head. It's really red. And my last name's Apple. So plenty of jokes, but I laugh them off and I keep on moving. And another guy is going to keep on moving. I don't even know what kind of transition that was, but I really want to talk about Angel Hernandez. Um. Yeah, I'm moving where? I don't know, but not in Major League Baseball anymore. Um, that that caught me off guard. I, I think, I don't know if anybody really realized that he had not umpired a game for a while. And we probably should have realized because there was nobody complaining for a couple weeks on, on social media about it. And there was no like viral clip. Um, I, we're going to probably find out more about like the entire situation later. Or it's a settlement situation and we'll just never know. Oh, uh, but I don't really funny. care. I don't care. I, it, I They could have cut him a big check. Whatever it is, I, I don't care. Like he's he's gone, and I think there's a lot less headache uh, that that'll come with that. And and I just I, I do feel bad because he's getting celebrated as if like a dictator was like taken out. Uh, but at the same time, you know he he did kind of fan the flames with the way that he would always respond to the criticism, and I think uh, the, the way that he would interact with players. But I, I don't think he'll be missed too much by by players or fans. No, I don't think so. Um... A new article came out on the New York Post kind of detailing it in short that, and I quote, the 62-year-old in MLB worked out a financial settlement that Mm -hmm. resulted in the controversial umpire walking away from the league after more than 30 years. So Major League Baseball approached Angel Hernandez earlier this season about retiring, and the two sides spent the last two weeks negotiating that. And Hernandez's lawyer, Kevin Murphy, told The Athletic in a text message he was not forced out. But... They did come to a settlement. And remember when we first got the report, I immediately texted in the group chat, they paid him. No oh. way that guy with all of his pride just put down, I was going to say put down the whistle, but there is no whistle <laughs> in baseball. Put down the timer for the pitch clock. Maybe he did that in the middle of the season. There's just no chance. So, and I am speculating, but at the same time, they did come to a settlement that MLB has been asking, hey, We will pay you in order to not do this anymore. And I remember, and it's included in this article, time back in 2017, where he tried to sue Major League Baseball for not putting him at the crew chief, for not putting him as the crew chief in the playoffs just because of his race. Yeah. Yeah. Like, not only that, the horrible calls on the field. You see him on umpire auditor or these umpire scorecards as some of the worst games. Now, they're not quite going to robo-umps, but it's clear that MLB behind the scenes is trying to work on this in order to get some of their worst umpires out of the game because the umpire's union is basically the mafia of baseball. You can't take them down. 
that you, you cannot take them down. Well, and it's funny too because Hernandez, I think he lost his racial discrimination lawsuit twice. Yes. Um, because it went to like a federal appeals court and they refused to reinstate the case. <laughs> like, like I, I think that there's a lot of areas where you can dive into potential discrimination and things like that. I think in this instance, just absolutely undermine it and make it frustrating and take away from like literal actual issues. But <laughs> the, the fact that there was two lawsuits and then the fact that he has just continued to be bad at his job. I would I would pay so much money to be a fly on the wall in those conversations and what so happened. Much. Like, no, he was not forced out. But <laughs> what's the word for g- being given an amount of money potentially? And this is speculation, but I'd assume uh, an amount of money that he cannot refuse to stop doing his job. I I would call that the next closest thing, because uh, of course he could say no. But who in their right mind is saying no? I think he's super prideful. To your point. But we all have we all have our pride up to a certain dollar amount. And then I'll throw that shit to the wayside. And I'm sure Angel Hernandez feels the same way. And I assume that they met that number. And that also shows you how bad it is. Like Major League Baseball, historically, just always like pinching, you know, pinching pennies, things like that. And they're cutting a check to Angel Hernandez to just get lost. I mean, you got to be bad. I almost like thought of you in that moment when you were um, describing about the amount of money that would get someone to lay down their pride. Like, for example, you're, I think, the best prospect writer out right now. I think so. And we're going to go over the prospect report. We're going to go over Corbin Carroll's swing. And if you don't hear it from his analysis, I don't know what to tell you. But if you had the biggest hater on Twitter and he DMs you and he says, Aram, I'm going to give you $50 million to never talk about prospects again. That's your passion. But maybe... Maybe we'd be if someone did the same thing to me about gambling or anything baseball related, I'd probably be like, yeah, you know what? I do love baseball. I'll do it on my own time. I'll disappear so fucking fast. <laughs> and like, it, I'd be sad. I'd have to figure some shit out, but I'd have 50 million. That'll help me figure that out. And I think that's exactly what Angel Hernandez is doing right now. I don't know how much money it is, of course, but I'm sure it's a nice check. And being tenured for so long, I'm sure gave him some leverage there, too. Um, I. I'm just interested what the precedent is here for like the future it, for guys, umpires that are are trending downwards, clearly terrible at their jobs. How do we police this? Is it going to be a forced settlement every single time? Is MLB now going to have a budget bigger than the Oakland A's to be able to force or not force, sorry, strongly suggest and persuade umpires out of this thing? Like, um, I think we need to come up with better ways of quality control, and then that'll probably end up saving MLB money in in the grand scheme because, you know, Laz Diaz is still around, and I think he's the new guy that is going to start to be the focus here. Um, and it, I, I'm excited to see who the next uh, – who the mob's going to go after next. I kind of imagine, like, the angry mob with the pitchforks, just like now that Angel's gone, just like doing a 180 and now going after uh, Laz Diaz there and <laughs> seeing how he does. But it, it's it's an interesting situation that I hope – Major League Baseball can find a way to just police a little bit better. Last thing for me on this, tell me if you think I'm crazy. Do you think that MLB is going to look at that checkbook and say, damn it, we just had to pay Angel Hernandez this much money. Let's accelerate the robo-ombs and let's do it quickly because this is not going to be worth it. Because to your point, foreseeing more of these happen time and time and time again, like this isn't the first and I doubt it's going to be the last. Do you think? think that's in the back of their mind just looking at that amount of money and saying i mean what are we even doing here people want the robo umps let's just do it i i wouldn't be shocked i I wouldn't be shocked at all if that's something that just continues to to be a a focus for them or they feel like hey if we weed out the bottom of the barrel maybe this this whole thing will be a little bit better and we won't be as desperate for for robo umps but they got to invest money into making the 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 automated strike zone better too so we got we got a lot of problems on that front not not Everybody can be Pat Hoberg. If they can figure out how to just clone Pat Hoberg, they're in business. Also, spin zone. This was so smart by Angel Hernandez. Get in with the mob. Do horrible at your job so they have to pay you to quit. I mean, think about it. He's way smarter than all of us. Who else could do that? Who else could go to their job, right? We all have jobs. If our boss said, I will pay you a ton of money to quit. Not a severance. An enormous settlement. God, that'd just, be awesome just to get lost. Yeah, because <laughs> you're so bad and we can't really fire you. I mean, that that shows you how much power umpires have. He played his cards perfectly. You have he, a nine. He did five. it really well. You have a nine to five. You show up at eleven, leave at three, and during those four hours, you're terrible. And then your boss just comes up to you and be like, "Hey, we're going to give you five months or five years salary to leave." 
Okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah. The last thing I'll say, like, you know, what's fucked up about it is, and again, I think it's an indictment on the MLB process is like Angel Hernandez, I think financially and just, just in general by like career and where he's at, at this present moment is better off having done what he did than if he was really good at his job. No one would have noticed. No. And he, he'd still be <laughs> going and he probably would have made less money. Again, I don't know what the check is, but I figure it's probably a pretty good one. And he's been tenured for a long time and he's going to have pension. And I'm sure he probably even got that negotiated in there. Maybe he increased the pension. Like th There's probably so I don't even know if I want to see the details of what that settlement is. But he ended up, I would assume, better off than if he was just good at his job. And that is probably a problem. <laughs> so for all those umpires out there, if you've been doing this for 20 plus years in Major League Baseball, start sucking. Just yes. do horrible because you're going to get a huge payday like the opposite of every other job in the entire planet all right let's yes. talk about corbin carroll for a second so again the article is linked and you posted on twitter it got tons and i tons couldn't believe of it traction it was fantastic one, probably one of our most viewed articles because it's so in depth and now normally when an article has been up for a little while maybe we won't cover it on the podcast but because it was so damn good we have to cover it in this episode. So I'm going to give the floor to you. Mm -hmm. I love that your first sentence in the article is baseball can be a cruel sport because a yeah. guy like Corbin Carroll comes up. We all bet him rookie of the year. We freaking bet Arizona Diamondbacks overs. We're obsessed with the profile. He's hitting the ball 460 feet in the minors at a 510 frame elite fielder. We're like, this is I mean, this is a phenomenal baseball player. I bet on him to win the MVP this year. That was a bet I made. I did too. Oh, you did too? Okay, <laughs> great. Like, we thought that it was just going to continue in the right direction, but to this point, it certainly hasn't, has it? No, and and I think that's what – is it started to, like, build and build and build uh, when we saw, like, the more prolonged struggles. I was like, okay, I need to dive into this further. And then I, I also want to shout out – the folks at Cespedes Barbecue and, and and Jordan Schusterman specifically, they 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 write uh, for for Yahoo Sports as well and, and did a really good job. I think about a month ago, sitting down with Corbin, sitting down with the D backs coaches, and they talked about some of the things that had stood out to him and uh, and and Carol even talked about like counter rotating, like rotating too too far towards the catcher and some little things like that. And I was like, okay, that that would explain some things. But when I'm looking at the batted ball data, I think there's more there that maybe they just haven't. Uh, the D-backs maybe haven't dove in head first into yet because Carroll has been good at every single stop of his career. And I think that was the part that kind of gets overlooked here. It's like, oh, he's been struggling for 50 games. Why have we not seen him, you know, turn this around? Because he's had pretty much one feel and swing for most of his life and it's worked at every single stop. The guy was one of the best players in the country in high school. He demolished it every single summer circuit. He gets drafted in the first round. He instantly goes to the complex, demolishes. Then you have COVID canceled season. Then they assign him straight to, to uh, I believe it was high A, seven games there. He's hitting 435 and then his shoulder tears. Comes back the next year. They start him in double A. So he essentially just skipped low A and high A. Balls out in double A, gets to triple A and then debuts that year. So that guy had never faced any on-field adversity other than the injury, and, and that's not really like mechanics, performance, anything like that. Gets to the big leagues, 130 WRC plus there. So this guy's never really had to make any adjustments uh, of any major significance. And then to that and he's point, never really, sorry to interrupt yeah. you real quick, you put up a 130 WRC plus that first season, then he wins Rookie of the Year easily. Like just the next finish, year. And then we're here. Like yes. that's it. So like he wins Rookie of the Year, he had a little bit of a slump, but then finishes strong, performs in the postseason, makes the World Series. Like, yeah. again, when are you ever going to change anything? But I don't think he realized, or I don't know if the D-backs realized that, like, slowly his mechanics were getting further and further away from where he originally was. Because it's a lot of movement, right? Like, it's a big leg kick. He's super athletic, and he makes it all work. And I put the side-by-side -side video together, which I was, again, I was not expecting it to, to, to go off like that. Uh, but I think a lot of people were just – surprised about how different the side-by-side -side was because you don't really notice it until you slow-mo and you go side-by-side. -side. And we talked about it a, a couple months or not even like, I would say what, three, four weeks ago Yeah, where you're like, dude, if you see this, like, why don't the D-backs? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe because he's never really had an issue and they don't even really feel like they need to dive too deep into it. But now they probably do. If you go side-by-side -side and you see the difference in, in his landing spot, like he is another, feels like almost a foot and a half further when he, who strikes his foot. So at that point, he's so wide 
with his landing spot that his weight is almost off of his back leg. So you imagine like I always give the analogy, you're trying to punch somebody, right? Like imagine that you have a punching bag instead. Let's go with a punching bag. And it's right in front of your front foot, you know, just, to, just like where home plate would be a little bit in front of that. And I tell you, get in your, your stance and you got to turn and punch it. Imagine like you're going to get into your back hip and you're going to rotate and you're going to punch. But imagine now you widen out and you have to like lean on your front foot more and you have almost nothing on your back foot and you got to punch. You're going to have nothing behind you. And I think that's where like Carroll has kind of lost his base. You see how far he strides forward. His weight's totally gone off his back foot. And then you see his hands get stuck behind him. And so when the hands get stuck behind you, they drag and then the path becomes flatter. And so when I was seeing some of those things, I was like, I wonder if the batted ball data will back that up. The first places I look when I see a drift forward, the bat lagging behind you in a flatter path, I immediately go look at pop-up rate. And his pop-up rate is more than doubled on fastballs last year. I also look at the ability to, to get to elevated fastballs. And he has been much worse against elevated fastballs this year. And then I also look at adjustability on breaking balls. And, you know, usually you're fooled, right? But you keep your weight back and you can still hit a breaking ball hard. If you're drifting forward, you have nothing left behind you to hit a breaking ball hard. So I think people were a little bit confused because it's like, oh, the bat speed is the same. Why is he not producing? The bat speed's the same because he's a freak athlete and he can get the, you know, get his hands going on fastballs. But when he starts to drift and, and starts to slow down, the path is so much longer and it's so much flatter that it becomes a lot more difficult to catch up to things. And, and also just to get your best swing off, started to make contact deeper, started to miss under a lot more or over the margin for, for error becomes much thinner where he just does not have as much room for contact. And the thing that floored me the most, another thing that I always look at is when you're drifting forward, it's hard to rotate, right? It's, it's hard to drift forward with your legs that wide and rotate. So you're not able to pull anything. In the piece, I put like a, his spray charts together on pitches 30 inches and above, which is about the middle of the strike zone and above. He has not pulled a line drive on a fastball middle up the entire season. Uh, like that is something that I think very much would show a path issue. And then the last thing that I just wanted to hit on, like on fastballs 30 inches and above. So the same thing, middle and up. He had an OPS over a thousand against four teamers 30 inches and above. This year, it's under 400. Again, because he's dragging the bats behind him, it's flat and he's working upwards. And especially when you're wider, your head's going to be lower, your whole body's going to be lower and you're working up towards the ball. It's really hard to get to that stuff. So I thought those were some of the things that really stood out to me. And again, I get into it like way deeper on some of the other like mechanical aspects that really stand out to me. But the number one thing is if you look at his position at, at like foot strike, he's almost doing a split, man. Like yeah, you just yeah. can't get a good swing off from there. And and I think that's been the big, big difference. Pull rate on fastball is down 8%. And then now I think because he feels more rushed, he feels like he's got to cheat more, right? Like, okay, my bat's getting caught behind me. It's getting stuck. I got to start it sooner. Needing to start it sooner results in swinging more frequently and also making worse decisions because you got to decide sooner. His chase rate on elevated fastballs is up 6%, which also has brought his chase rate up on sliders too because he's trying to catch everything out front now. And that chase rate's up 13%. So it, that's where you hear like guys caught in between. Now he's caught in between because he's trying to cheat for the fastball that he still can't catch up to. And now he's out front on the breaking ball that he used to actually hit pretty well. And now he's in between. So I think these are things that he can easily rectify. Not easily. It takes a lot of reps and it's it's difficult, especially when you haven't made any major changes in your career. But I do think that like once they identify what's causing him to to leak forward so much and to lose that back hip and to be so wide, I think everything else is going to start to clean up. And I, he's supremely talented. I'm not worried about him in the grand scheme, but this might be a long stretch because it's hard to make those adjustments in season. And clearly they didn't you know really know that this was going to happen during the offseason. But the bat angle is a huge part of it, too. And from your article, you mentioned the shoulder thing, but I felt like most of it was just about how his mechanics have continued to kind of lag. The reason I say lag is he's had so much success, like you've said, so why change anything? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. We talked about his career even from high school up to the rookie of the year last year. He's never had any struggles, so why would you change it? Do you think this is just in a – a combination of those things where every day it just gets a little bit worse? Or do you think that it is from that shoulder or do you think it's more of a combination of both? I, 
I think so. You know, it's funny. I think the shoulder is not as much of an issue, but I think it might have been what started this whole thing where like, mm. you know, if your shoulder doesn't feel right, you're trying to compensate and all of a sudden you're trying to get a little bit more in, in your base and you're trying to get your lower half going a bit more. And he also like because of that drift forward, you're naturally going to try to counter something. And so his hands go further back behind him, I think, in just a subconscious effort to keep his weight back. I think that this is just something, whether it started because of the shoulder and just his body didn't feel right or whatever it is, I feel like it's one of those things that happens slowly over time where like if you're sitting right now where you're sitting and I moved you a millimeter or like let's even say like half an inch every day, you wouldn't realize it. But then after 20 days, you'd be like, why am I all the way to the right of my desk? But each day you would notice because it's so incremental. I think that's kind of what happened with him is where he just went further and further down the rabbit hole. And now he still feels like he's swinging it the same way he was before because it's been such an incremental change, but he doesn't realize how far he's gotten away from where he once was. And teams are very careful with making major adjustments to hitters because you don't want to get them so far away from where they naturally were that they can't find their way back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't retrace your steps. So I think they wanted to like make sure that they try some small things. You know, the, again, they talked about like the counter rotation, which I, I I think is is kind of an ingredient of of the whole thing. But I think they kind of didn't dive into the actual thing that you can see on the open side. I, I think now they're probably going to be a little bit more urgent and say, hey, let's try some things that are a little bit more dramatic. I don't even think it needs to be that dramatic though. It's just not over striding as much and and trying to be more vertical, but. He's never really hit that way. He's just gotten so far down the the rabbit hole here that he's got to rein it back in. And I'm curious how they're going to go about it. But when the batted ball data always agrees with the mechanical you know, things that I see, uh, I usually feel pretty good about that hypothesis. And uh, I, I think I think that it's something that's going to take some time, but you, you can't teach the talent here. You can't teach the bat speed. You can't teach the feel for the barrel. And I think all those things are going to come back. Guys like him get away with more. And I think that's also how he kind of inched further away from what's mechanically sound because he's so athletic and so quick and get away with it. But up to a certain point, then you just, you just, it gets to a point where you're just making it too hard on yourself. And I think that's where he's, where he's stuck right now. I like how you use the term hypothesis. Just listening to it made me feel smarter, even though I'm just sitting here. So speaking about smart people, teacher man commented <laughs> on on your thread and teacher man, yes. um, if you're unaware, he is a hitting coach that was, I guess, grew a lot of fame because he was working with Aaron Judge and Aaron mm-hmm. Judge's swing looks perfect. We were talking about most beautiful swings in our group chat, I think, the other day, and I mentioned Judge. It's not as aesthetically pleasing as a Ken Griffey Jr. or even currently, like I say, everything negative about jazz but one thing i will never debate that swing is smooth now judge doesn't have that smoothness but the way the bat path goes through the zone it's like a perfect swing to hit home runs and then you add the fact that he's 6'7 280 but we're not talking about aaron judge we're talking about teacher man and teacher man put a long thread (laughs) under your analysis so my question to you is did he say anything that maybe you disagreed with or did he open up a thought bubble in your head thinking to yourself, Oh, I might've missed something here. Just tell us how that kind of interaction went because he is on the forefront of changing swings and making them better. I actually think he has a lot of really good thoughts. He also is Kerry Carpenter's hitting coach as well. And I mean, you've seen the progression of that guy. Um, His problem is the way that he communicates and he's a very polarizing figure. Um, He's he's I've learned a lot about swing components from the way that he looks at at the body and the way that the body works. And I think that he dove into it on like a, a biological level. Like when you use the word femur and when we're talking about a swing, like you even start to lose me a little bit. Uh, but no, I thought like what he was saying was was pretty much along the same lines of of the general mechanics I was talking about. But then he got into like the ball and socket of your hip and how that works. And like all of that makes sense. But I think that's where he loses people. Um, but I, I thought the thread was really fascinating. Of course, he plugged uh, his his uh, hitting course at the bottom. But I know I bought um, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, I thought it was re- it was funny because I got a couple of texts from some some buddies in Pro Bowl that you know have liked his philosophy, and they're like, "You made it," because um, it's just like we always send stuff back and forth that of, of some of his philosophy. Sometimes it's it's extreme, but I think he's as smart as they come and is really figured some things out when it comes to swing path. And I thought this stuff, what he said was really fascinating because it's, it's a totally different player in terms of him and judge, but it's a lot of the same components. I just think sometimes it gets a little bit too far there where like 
I don't think a hitter needs to be focusing on the socket of their hip. And there's just some more general things that they can do to like get to where they need to go. But I felt like it was, uh, you know, he's pretty outspoken if he doesn't like what you said. And he didn't, uh, he didn't rip me. No. So that's just, always good. He, he was like ripping and like he rips players. So like quote tweet, like Jared Kalnick swing and just be like, this sucks. <laughs> and Jared Kalnick will be like, give it a rest. Like I've seen that interaction. So uh, no, that was, that was a cool wrinkle in it. And again, I, I like don't want to take all of your time and, and make Peter just sit there, but I, I put a lot of time into this. So like, I would love for people to check it out in the links in the episode description, but um, there's a lot more of like some smaller mechanical things. And I wanted to try to use it as like an opportunity to explain some of the things that I look at in prospects too. And like how the batted ball data and mechanics can kind of marry together and how certain things mechanically can be indicated in the way that, you know, the ball is being hit and, and maybe some changes in the batted ball data, like the pop-ups when you're drifting um, or, or just struggles with, stuff on the upper half of the plate, not being able to pull the ball. Like there's a lot of different things there that I think stand out and, and can uh, you know be helpful. So to wrap up on this, I'm thinking about the fantasy baseball owners mm-hmm. who are listening and they're hearing you talk and they're getting worried because it's not like Corbin Carroll tomorrow is just not going to have as big of a leg kick or as big of a stride or be able to fix all this in a couple of days. Maybe he can, right? I'm never going to doubt him because he's never failed. Yeah. But at the same time, like everyone's a human being and it's baseball to go back to your first sentence is a cruel sport. So for those owners sitting there with Corbin Carroll drafting him in the first couple of rounds because he's freaking Corbin Carroll, I assume some people in the first 10 picks, what do they do with him? You got to hold him, And it stinks because, you know, you got to wait till you see in a, tangible adjustment and i'd imagine like again I, reading that piece i was surprised to not see anything about the overstriding but i thought they did a really good job um talking about like they, talking to dan heron about you know how teams are preparing for him and that's the other side of it now too is he used to crush fastballs now he's not crushing elevated fastballs as much guess what he's seeing now even more of them. So it's it's not that the league is adjusted to him. There was nothing to adjust to. They already had the scouting report on him from AAA guys. Don't, and that's what Dan Heron brought up. And that's why I thought Jordan Schusterman's piece was awesome. Like Dan Heron's like, they already know you at that point. Like it, it works for pitchers a little bit more, but if you're a top, the number one prospect in baseball, like they got a plan for you already. It'll get better, but it, it's not executing some new plan. They found the weakness uh, that he has now created. He used to crush the fastballs. Now he's not, he's seen a, I think like a 7% uptick in four seamers and a 5% uptick of that portion of pitches in elevated four seamers and another 5% uptick in inside four seamers as well. When you see the spray chart there and know that he can't beat your pull side right now, you're going to attack, attack, attack. And then remember what I said, where he's cheating more now to to side earlier and they're throwing more fastballs up, his chase rate's up 6% and that's of a larger pool of pitches He's just expanding more now, too. So now the scouting report's a little bit easier to execute against him. He used to be one of those guys where it's like, how do you get him out? Um, So I I think that's what's kind of causing it to snowball. But I think from a fantasy perspective, the the second he starts to make that mechanical adjustment, I think he's going to get right so quick. And I do feel more confident than ever that it's not the shoulder. And I'd almost be more concerned if it was the shoulder, right? It's like, oh, my gosh, like, what are we going to do here? The exit velocity on fastball is exactly the same. The bat speed is still great. Uh, I think Troy Lavello said that the, the bat speed is actually higher than last year. Huh. So I think I think he'll get there. It just it might take most of the year and that would stink. I would keep looking for uh, for mechanical adjustments, see if he's narrower and things like that. And uh, maybe you can buy him in some other leagues. But he's too talented to to give up on. And uh, even in this s- single season. And I, I do think at the end of the day, he's, he's going to figure it out. I just think the Diamondbacks are pretty hands off when it comes to the swing mechanic stuff, which can be good but also can be tough when your guys are struggling. I don't want to go trade for him now. By love. You should. I, 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 I'm thinking about it in my dynasty league. I am. Huh. Um, he's just, he's too good, man. And good. Uh, dynasty, especially like if I got to sit through this year and deal with it, I will, uh, because I know he's going to go to a, a third party hitting coach if the D backs can't do it. And I am a little worried. The backs just don't touch anybody. Drew Jones who talked about that swing. She's never gotten better. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a little different with Carol. During the offseason, he'd go to a third party hitting coach and, and and they'll get to the bottom of that pretty quickly. Uh, but I I I would I would be interested in picking him up. He's too good. He's too freaking good. It's freaking Corbin Carroll. So before we talk World Series odds, mm-hmm. quick break. Arm, 
Let's do a World Series odds check-in on BetMGM. So over the past couple of weeks, we have been checking in on Rookie of the Year, MVP, Cy Young. We've been focusing on players and analyzing them, but we haven't really analyzed the teams when it comes to the World Series. And the reason I wanted to do it now is a lot of these teams are in interesting spots. And then looking at their June schedule, what will they then do maybe based on that? Do they have a lane? Do they have an easy June schedule that will make the GMs then think, all right, the time is now. We make the big trades and then we go after it, right? Or is a team teetering a little bit? They have a really tough June schedule and you should stay away. So we're going to give you a lot of wagers. I have a long shot wager. I'm not sure if Arm does, but I know I do. And if you want to play any of them, use code just baseball on BetMGM. Why? No sweat. First bet offer up to fifteen hundred. Now, what the hell does that mean? Well, if you use code just baseball when you deposit, and then you place something up to fifteen hundred dollars. If it loses, you will then get it back in bonus bets. If it wins, it's probably going to be a long shot wager and it's going to be freaking awesome and you're going to have a ton of money. So that's why I highly recommend if you have not downloaded BetMGM yet and you want to wager, doesn't have to be big, on any of these bets that we're about to talk about. It's not going to be just straight betting, but we will just talk about all the teams and we'll reference the odds. And if you happen to like any of them, it's the perfect place to do it. But remember... Must be 21 or older. Terms and conditions apply. Gambling problem, call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. Arm, I want to start at the top with the Los Angeles Dodgers. And what I also have in front of me is Fangraph's projections. So what Fangraph's does is in percentile chances, every team has the percent chance of making the playoffs, to make the LDS, like NLDS, ALDS, win it go to the NLCS, all that kind of stuff, up to World Series. And betting odds are just implied probability. And what that means is they'll assign a plus 2,500 line. Now, what does that mean? That's basically, they think that you have around a 3 or 4% chance. So what mm-hmm. we can do is look at fan graphs and say, well, Fangraphs thinks they have a 6% chance, but the odds imply a 2% chance. That's what betters like to call value. So what I use is the Bat X on Fangraphs. It's my favorite projection system. It's developed by Derek Cardi, who's fantastic. You got to follow him on Twitter. Um, I don't know if I have his Twitter right in front of me, but I'll find it at the tail end of this episode. That projection system has won multiple awards for its accuracy. So I use that and I gauge it to find value in the market. And I found value on a pretty specific team. But I want to start with the team that these projection systems every single year say that this team is the prohibitive favorite. The betting odds always tell us they're the prohibitive favorite. But how in the world could we ever rationalize putting a single dollar on them? And that is the Los Angeles Dodgers. On (laughs) BetMGM right now, they're about plus 300. To put that in perspective, next best is the Phillies and the Yankees around plus 550. And when I say plus, I'm just trying to explain it for everybody listening. I apologize if you've heard this before. But if you were to bet on the Dodgers... $100 $100 wager would win you $300. That's just not worth it. Considering what have the Dodgers done in the playoffs to deserve it? Because yeah. the Dodgers have been the favorites for a while now. And then in 2023, they get swept by the Arizona Diamondbacks. They were sure shit the favorite in 2022, maybe not the overall favorite, but they lost in the NLDS to the Padres. Then in 2021, They didn't even make it to seven games in the NLCS against the Braves. They won in five in the NLDS against the Giants, and they won three to one in that wildcard game. Yes, they won a World Series in 2020, and I'm not going to call it a Mickey Mouse ring, but it was in 2020, right? Oh, we'll give them that. Which, by the way, the 2020 season would be over like today, I think. Exactly, but we'll we'll give them that, right? But in 2019, losing the NLDS, got bounced in the World Series. So what have the Dodgers proven to any of us that they deserve to be the prohibitive favorite just because they're the juggernaut right now in the regular season? Yes. At the wedding I was just at, uh, we've, I've talked about this before. All of my friends from California, diehard Dodger fans, and they were giving me shit about my takes about the Dodgers on this podcast because they were saying, Peter, why do you give a shit about the regular season? We don't. 
We're just watching our players. We know that we're going to win 100 games. And they're right. They know that they're going to win 100 games. Right, right. they just got swept by the Reds. They don't care. Now, I don't know if they speak for all Dodger fans, but I think all Dodger fans internally, all they want to see is their team win in the playoffs. And they have not done that. So why would I bet on a team as a prohibitive favorite to win the World Series when they have never proven anything and they've always had the super team? Traded for Max Scherzer, traded for Trey Turner. They've had court, like they've done everything up to this point. Do you see any reason to look at the Dodgers and say, yes, they're definitely my World Series pick, other than the fact of they're really good? I, they're they're three to one for good reason. Like I, I they're the best team by a, a lot on paper. Right? Like when you when you look at the three Hall of Famers, and that's the crazy part is like they're never out of a ball game, especially when it's just like you got Betts, Otani, Freeman, just just waiting for you, uh, and how quickly that they can turn that into runs, and then Will Smith after that. I think the other side that makes this team a little bit more potent to me than maybe some other years is. I, there's something about the glass now, Yamamoto, and then even a Bueller, or or we'll see if Kershaw's back, but whatever it may be. Like I think by by the time you get to the end of the season, those guys, assuming Glass now is healthy, like that's as scary of a, of a three I think as as we've you know seen. I know they've had some really good ones, but they're gonna have Bobby Miller back at some point too. I'm like that's gonna be really scary. So I can see it, but to the point of like, and I think these these conversations with like the probability from fan graphs and like the betting is fun because even if you're not really interested in in actually betting or or the betting odds per se it's always fascinating to see like where the rational baseball conversation goes and then you know where the the most precise uh I would say the most precise predictors of anything you talked about like the, the bat x being award winning nobody is projecting anything better than Vegas that's why they got the castles in the desert so it's always interesting to see where they're at I think I understand why, because I mean, if they if they were anything other than the prohibitive favorites, everybody's emptying the bank account on the Dodgers. And, and you know, that's scary because you're exposed to a team that you know, could finally have it all work. I always feel like in baseball, if if somebody's a, a heavy, heavy favorite, it never really goes well because you just I'd rather have the field. And I, I like to think about it more this way, I guess the Dodgers. And we're going to talk about like your long shot pick. And, and now we're looking at like the National League picture. But do the are, are the Dodgers that much better than the Phillies? No. I, 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 and I'm definitely going to have Dodgers fans ripping us. I think the Dodgers are awesome. We're talking about, like, should they be far and away the favorites Dodgers the rest fans, of the way? How can you think that you're way better than the Phillies right now? What, 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 evidence, what evidence do you have that you're better than the Phillies? The Phillies are objectively playing better. They're more postseason proven in the sense of like they, they haven't won the world series but i feel like they've just been farther and this is i the trust best. them for sure i trust, I trust them. them this I, like going to the bank versus going to chavez ravine i'd rather play in chavez ravine i'm sorry yep. i think daughter fans would admit that of course right how can I, I, you think that you're better than the phillies right now when the phillies are objectively playing better in the regular season and then their postseason pedigree what what scares me is the dodgers can probably go get just about anybody uh, their farm system's really freaking good as always. And I think it's more obvious than ever. Like I felt like some other years it was like, they were just uh, adding good players just to add good players. But there's some areas here, like right now where they are so deficient that you go out and add an impact bat. It could really change the way things, things look like, again. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just thinking about Gavin Lux being out there pretty much every single day and, and posting an OPS barely above 500. I know Chris Taylor's playing more because Max Muncy's hurt, but I mean, that guy's been unusable. Uh, Hayward's been hurt and trying to get his feet under him, but you, you'd hope to a World Series team would have a better option in the other corner as well. I, I do think that they're going to go make a splash and it could really make a big difference in this lineup. Like I'm imagining, because we know how good the top is. And then even like a Brent Rooker, you throw into this lineup. I, I know they probably wouldn't go that route because – They'd rather have someone that could probably defend a little bit better out there. Uh, and the DH spot's obviously taken by Otani right now. But like, I'm just imagining like you replace Jason Hayward with Brent Rooker, or you replace a Gavin Lux with whatever, like any good infielder. I, I like all of a sudden the outlook looks a lot different. But to the point of like what we've been talking about, I, I think the Phillies should be right there with them. And, and they're not from an odds perspective. And you know what's funny? So I want to talk about how the Phillies and the Yankees, right, the next two favorites, could definitely win. When I look at a Yankees team, what I look for in a successful postseason team, which is different than a great regular season team, 
Like the Dodgers are a great regular season team. There's plenty of them. But once you get to the playoffs, I need the three horsemen at the top. We talk about it all the time. I need a great bullpen who strikes people out. I need an offense that is balanced from power to getting on base, right? So you have the uh, bat to ball guys at the top and you have the guys who can hit a home run at every second. The Yankees and the Phillies, and of course the Dodgers too, they have those elements. But when I look at Fangraph's projection systems, the Phillies and the Yankees, based on what they think is going to happen, Fangraph's, so overvalued. Incredibly. So what Fangraph's is giving them a percentile chance of, the Yankees at 13.8% and the Phillies at 87 So if we look at implied probability, plus 550 for the Yankees is giving them a 15% chance, right? So if if they're only giving them a 13% chance, they should be closer to seven or 800. Why are they like that? They're the New York Yankees, which is why I say at the beginning of the season, hard to find value on the Yankees ever because they're the most popular team. And then the Phillies are the hottest team in baseball. So of course, Vegas is going to make those Minus EV, which may basically means negative expected value. So if you take that pick over time, you're going to lose more often than you won't. So both of those teams, we can talk about why they can win the World Series. But if anyone is listening to this and wants to put money on them, I am letting you know right now, not just the bad X. I looked all around, objectively overvalued wow. by like two, 300 points. And it makes perfect sense. But yeah. we can talk about how they could, because of course they could. But yeah. based on value, they are both bad bets right now. Interesting. Yeah, it makes sense because again, I mean, they're they're also you know, predicting you know the the psychology of it and where where people are going to allocate their 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 money. But I, I think you can make a similar argument, and we talked about this the other day too. Jack and I did. I think the Phillies are in as prime of a position as they've ever been in um, because of just the way Alec Bohm's playing now. Uh, Bryce Harper's just all the way healthy and 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 playing, you know, not clogging the DH spot. Schwarber finally being back in the DH spot. Uh, you know, I, I think Marsh has really kicked it into another gear. And then the pitching being what it is. But I also think from the trade capital perspective, they have two guys that, you know, I think are going to join our top 100 in the update uh, and, and spoiler alert there. And like Aiden Miller for for sure. And Starlin Kaba also has a chance. And then they've had some breakout pitchers. And so they can go out and make some of the bigger splashes that they've made in a while. And, and I think that's scary. Uh, but they're also not going to do that for a little bit. And they're going to come down to earth a little bit more, yeah, at least reasonably, because they've been playing outrageously well for the most part. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it is interesting from that perspective. Like those are the, the the two heavy favorites, the Dodgers and the Phillies. And I do think that there's other teams that are extremely talented out there that can make a run and, and we're going to talk about it. But um, I always have the concern too about like peaking too early. Yep. And I, I some, sometimes I think it's a silly conversation, but then other times I, I, I think Not, of, I don't think it is well, at all. the Yankees, the Yankees, what was the, it was it 21 that yeah, we were that, that they were the best team that was ever assembled like 46 and then they, 18 or something crazy like that over a 60 game stretch and then just fizzled you know as as the season progressed and i mean that was that was insane the way they started we're like this is the best team of of all time <laughs> and then you just see things slow down uh, and of course injuries can play a part in that but I think that's where I think the depth side of things comes in and, and everything like that but that's also why i think you got to look at some of the teams that maybe are underperforming right now and who you can kind of envision having things click the other way and and take off the rest of the way. So that's what I want to get into next. But before we do, for any Phillies or Yankees fans listening out there that really want to bet on their team right now, what I want you to do is I want you to wait for your team to start sucking. I'm a Yankee fan. I know it's going to happen at some point. Phillies yeah, fans, they'll, they'll get cold. Phillies fans, you're smart. You know that it's going to happen at some point. You've seen how cold your team can get. Wait until it looks horrible, then bet them. The most overvalued team right now is not the Yankees. It is the Phillies, based on projection systems. Projection systems think the Phillies should be around plus 1050 or plus 1100 in that range. They're plus 525. For the Yankees, they think they should be plus 700. You know what's funny about the Dodgers? They think they should be plus 300, based on those projections. But again... Those are the same projections every year. It's I, I always do, the Dodgers. I do think that this is the Dodgers team that could just run the table. 100%, right? Just this, because of this has just to because be the, of team, the, right? the, the yeah, star of power 
the star power just being on a different level. And then the 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 pitching, I still think could just click on a different level as well. Like if Walker is is you know still able to to throw that many innings in the back end there, and I think that's been the whole point all along. And I think Yamamoto is just he's going to really really settle in. I think in the back end, and then you got Glass now, and then you got Miller. Like, how do you compete with that when you also you're going to there's a good chance you're going to be down one zero or, or worse in a lot of games with the way that that lineup comes out. I could just see them punching everybody in the mouth in the playoffs. Like. If they don't do it this year, I don't know when they will. So I'm not ever going to uh, fade this group, but I agree with the general Dodgers sentiment. I just have a weird feeling that, you know, this might be the year where they make the playoffs a little boring, Um, but it would probably be fun regardless because of how good they are. So here's a team that I want everybody to keep their eyes on. And remember what I was talking about, Aram, in the sense of wait until it looks terrible. Yep. Ronald Acuna Jr. goes down. Spencer Schrider goes down. Based on projections, the Braves among these favorites is the one that's undervalued or at least proper value now because the books, they didn't really adjust other teams. And I think that's an important thing to say that when we're looking at odds, a Braves fan or just a general MLB fan might think, oh, Braves lose Ronald Acuna Jr. Phillies odds get better. Brewers odds get better. Cubs, Padres, everybody gets better because Ronald Acuna Jr. is out. Braves won a World Series without him. It's not yes. as big of a deal as fans want it to think that it is. Ronald Acuna Jr. is incredible when healthy. Freaking won the MVP, 40-70. He's amazing. But the great thing about baseball is, and that's why the Diamondbacks and the freaking Rangers were in the World Series, is that it takes a team. So what Vegas did is that they dropped the odds down to around plus 800. And if we're looking at these projection systems... I'm going into my implied probability calculator. They give them about a 12% chance. The odds indicate right now that it's around 11%. Again, which is then showing value. It's really hard during parts of the season to find actual value on favorites. But Mm -hmm. after Acuna goes down, this is when maybe when you start to jump on the Braves. I'm not out here saying, yes, the Braves are my World Series pick. But what we're trying to do is find value throughout the season. You lose Strider, you lose Acuna, the offense doesn't look good, people are hurt, and it just doesn't look good. But we know the Braves, and we know how good Chris Sale is, potentially the Cy Young winner in the National League. That's how damn good he was. On the plane, I was looking at his stats. Holy shit. Like I knew he was great, but he's arguably the best pitcher in the league right now. We know they have a great bullpen. We know that they, you know, they're kind of similar to the Dodgers in that light, but they did win in 2021, right? We're not that far removed from that World Series win. So I'm looking at a Braves team where if you're looking for a favorite to buy low on, based on the math, you should be targeting the Braves. So let's like talk this out. Just like in terms of just from a baseball perspective, hundred percent. How does this team kind of make up for the loss, and and then how does this team become a a World Series contender? Because I, I think they are very close without Strider and Acuna still. And I think you know we we're talking about it, them as you know the one B as as the favorites, and then going into the year when you just see everything that they've got going on, and then adding Sale and and, and some of the pieces, and just even adding Kalnick into a role where he doesn't need to thrive; he just needs to be decent. Like, they, they, and then Duvall. Like, there was so much length to this team, and now the the length is turned into, uh, I think, guys that now have to step up for them, which is helpful because it could be a lot worse than Adam Duvall in one corner and Jared Kalnick in the other when you're this banged up. Uh, it could also be a lot worse rotation wise than Sale, Morton, Freed, and Reynaldo Lopez, and then Spencer Schwellenbach. By the way, who's going to make his big league debut? Uh, we talked about that in depth on the call up, but Schwellenbach, just real quick before, before I forget, really, really talented arm, uh, two way guy at Nebraska can run it up to the upper 90s funky release that I think is actually going to play pretty well good slider sneaky change up I, I they're pushing him quickly he only through 13 innings in double a but I, I think this is a guy that is is more ready to help them than maybe like a, a Waldrop who I like a lot but it's just still kind of a work in progress Schwanbach could end up plugging in and being helpful or it could be like AJ Smith Shaver who also looked pretty good before he he hurt his oblique but like they've got options there and they've they've also got some trade capital I I, I guess getting back to the original point here how does this team get itself back to World Series contender? Like you look up the middle, it's it's great. You know, you're not going to change anything with Mike Harris. Orlando Arcia has just settled in as that guy. I know he's not hitting great, but he's just such a good defender. He's your your nine hitter. That's fine. 
Albies is great. Ozuna is one of the best hitters in the game. Olsen's going to get going. Riley's been hurt. He's going to be good. We don't have any worries about him. Murphy's awesome. Like it's really just the corner outfield spots, I guess. It, it, but then also, do they need like a, a better pitcher in there? Like, well, what does this team need to be able to go toe to toe with the Dodgers or the Phillies? I guess that's really what it ultimately comes down to is, is what, what are they missing that those other teams have? So here's what they are missing. And this is what I thought about on the plane. If I'm Alex Anthopoulos, I called my, I call my old friends in Toronto and I say, what's the price on Gosman? Ooh. Because what I think they need is they need a right-hander. Because if you look at the first two pitchers in their playoff rotation, right, it's going to be Chris Sale and Max Fried, whatever order, maybe Fried's first, don't care. Those are the first two guys, right? Then you have Reynaldo Lopez, but Braves fans, like if we're talking about winning the World Series, I know Reynaldo Lopez looks good and I hope it continues. And I'm not seeing anything underlying to make me think that it doesn't. But I, I just want another as, option as a yeah, better another option just in case as a better. I can't just slot Reynaldo Lopez into the three and be like, oh, yeah, he's winning because in May he's been awesome. I, I just can't do that. Will he? Of course he could. Can I count on that? No. Charlie Morton. 40. <laughs> like, that's just the bottom line. And he hasn't looked great lately. Is it going to get better as the season progresses? Might stay the same. There's a chance it gets worse. So I think they need a solid righty and who better to call the Blue Jays and say, what will you give us for Kevin Gosman? Because Kevin Gosman's not off to the best start, but we just got a reclamation project from the Red Sox in that same division. And look what we turned him into. Can we get Kevin Gosman? So then I don't know what that would cost. It probably costs a decent amount, but the Braves have a good farm system. And obviously Alex Anthopoulos, if that trade ever came across the ticker, we'd probably say, well, the Braves won. Because that's what they do for every trade. Yeah. Or maybe something cheaper. You can do a a twofer. Go get Fetty and go get Michael Kopech from the White Sox. Now, Fetty is not going to be the best pitcher alive. But what he does do is provide a team with a great offense a chance to win every day. And I think that's what Fetty would provide. Now, Brace fans are like, no, no, no. You just put us on Gosman. So let's stay on that point, right? We're going to get Kevin Gosman. All right, in the outfield, Jared Kelnick's not going to hit lefties. So no. why don't we go get Tommy Pham? We'll platoon them. Proven postseason hitter. You know he's going to love those lights. He's going to go into Philly or he's going to go in Chavez Ravine. I've been here before. I'm totally fine. Let it, me guide you. Tommy Pham's personality with Chris Sale's personality, love that for the Braves. <laughs> and that's not even that big. If you want to make another big hitter type deal, I don't know. Maybe you go freaking grab, I mean, this this would be stupid, but I don't know. Could you grab Boba Shed or something like that? I don't. We can talk about big hitters that they could get, but all I think they are away is a dominant right-handed starter, a great bullpen arm, and an impact bat. And that seems like kind of a lot, but it's really not if you hit a home run on one of them and then fill in the gaps on the other. So, And the Braves can definitely do that. And then if they do, we're talking about the Braves in the same conversation and this number is gone. So I'm actually thinking about putting the Braves in my portfolio right when nobody wants them. And that's exactly how I want to bet on futures. Grab the number of teams you know are good when in this time period we're at right now, nobody wants them because we know that they're great. And if they lose... Like, we're not hammering these plays. These are long-shot plays, right? Yeah. You probably yeah. won't lose sleep over it. But if you have a winning ticket and you're going through the playoffs and you get to the World Series and you get a plus 800 bet, hedge with the other team, immediate profit. That's how I like to work these futures. It, it's it's interesting. I, I think they could piece it together with a fam bat-wise, and they've done that, right? It's always been the more the role player, platoon guy that helps them in the outfield. I agree. I think they need to swing for the fences with an arm yeah. uh, because I think they've got the arms to get them through the regular season. They, even a Charlie Morton, like that's your four, yeah, five, fine. that's fine. You, get to the you can rotate rookies a, in that five spot with Schwellenbach and smith Chauvin when he's healthy and and whoever else and and be fine. Elder, Vines, what, whatever it is. I, I just feel like if we're trying to build a team, you know, if you're if you're Alex Anthopoulos and you're looking, you're staring down the barrel of the postseason and you're trying to match up with the Phillies and you're trying to match up with the Dodgers, you need that one other dog. I, and I, w- I agree with you 100% on that. And I think it needs to be a right-handed dog. And Lopez has been awesome. 
And maybe he ends up being that dog for them, that third guy. But just in case, I I wouldn't mind going to get another one, Uh, especially when we're seeing, you know, how how it can be, how important it can be sometimes to win the division. I know sometimes the Braves don't want to do that. Maybe it'll be better for them not doing that this year. Uh, But I I do think that they can go make some some moves too. They're never going to have a a farm system that ranks highly per se, but they have a lot of trade pieces, uh, especially on the pitching side, and they could go get somebody uh, that, that makes an impact. And I love the Gosman thought, and I could definitely see that. Uh, and, and I think he, he could be a little bit cheaper than some of the other moves from a prospect capital perspective. Uh, but I, I'm interested, you know, do they do we see a rare in division trade with the Marlins for one of their arms? Uh, that could always be surprising. It wouldn't shock me, to be honest, because I don't think the Marlins care. Um, I, I think we could see it with with a few different teams potentially. But I do think they need to go get that that arm, that impact arm. And I'm curious to see you know how they go about that and how aggressive they'll be. The last team I want to talk about, so I just wanted to go through all the prohibitive favorites and we're talking about value because if we go through every single team, we're going to be here for 50 hours. And also remember, we're going to continue to do these types of things, but we have some long shot bets that I want to talk about. The last team that is technically a favorite is the Baltimore Orioles at plus a thousand on BetMGM. And similarly to the Phillies, not quite as much, but they are very overvalued based on the projection systems. And now the complete opposite of the Dodgers Projection systems have always hated the Orioles. Always. Yes. And I think I know why. I don't think they know how to quantify these young prospects. Like what to make of them. Because we saw what they looked like in the regular season and then what happened in the postseason. They looked like the AAA team, if that makes sense. Obviously, yeah. that's a little harsh Orioles fans. But a lot of the younger players like Gunnar Henderson and stuff folded. So when you look at these projection systems... Gunnar Henderson might win the MVP this year, but he's not priced like that. He might be priced by the books like that, but you look at projection systems. That's why I'm never really on the Orioles in terms of from a betting angle. I talk about them all the time, thinking about how great they are, but from a betting angle, there's never any value on them. They're always overrated based on the numbers. But I think there's an element of one team kind of breaks the matrix in sports. If we go to the NFL, the Detroit Lions are a perfect example. Public's always on them. Always. We talk about they public win. versus sharps. They win. The Lions are great. I'm thinking about getting on the Lions again this year on the NFL side. It's just one of those teams that the books don't truly know how to quantify. There's always one. And I think the Orioles are the one. Because look at their team right now. If we're talking about what a good postseason team looks like, Aren't they exactly that? Burns, Grayson, and then they just have so many other pitchers. Like Cole Irvin's doing really well right now. They have a GM who's proven right now that he's going to be aggressive. Kyle Bradish, like a rotation like that. Bradish, Grayson, and Corbin Burns. And then you have that bullpen and this offense that can hit a home run at any point, play great defense, but also beat you with speed. They're the perfect team. And But if you look at it, Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. And they can outbid anybody if they want to. Exactly. And they have more prospects coming up the pipe. Like Jackson Holiday, when he first came up, he was terrible, right? What if he comes back up and hits the ground running? Of course he could. He's Jackson freaking Holiday. And then if one guy struggles, like a Heston Kirstad struggles, they'll send him down and they'll freaking bring up Kyle Stowers, who's playing well. Or they'll just put in Jordan Westbrook. Like, how does a book quantify Jordan Westbrook? It's, It's really hard because they don't have that much data on him. Mm-hmm. Right. Like you talk about triple A betting. It's hard to make the lines because they don't have that much data. They don't have these algorithms. So the Orioles are a team that it's so hard for me to ever tell anyone to bet because objectively by every projection model, they're going to say that they are 500 points overvalued. But in my baseball brain, they're the only team. Like if we're talking about an American League team, they should be up there with the Yankees. Of course they should. Why shouldn't they be? But they're not. Yeah but they're in the middle and it's tough. I I'm, I'm a believer too. I, I just think I'll, I'll fall. I'll die on this hill every time when I look at a team like this. And I think it was the youth aspect last year, as you mentioned, and now they've kind of been there, done that a little bit. And, and, and I think we're even seeing it with the way that they're playing this year, where they come back in games where they're behind. And I don't know, I think there's a little bit more poise and holding leads and just playing better ball all around and, and Gunner taking a step forward. Like, does it quantify Gunner becoming in, you know, going from all star to MVP? You know, does it quantify those types of things? Uh, Ryan Mountcastle, largely unavailable last year, very, very solid this year. 
I think there's little components like that 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 are really hard to to bake into this, and you definitely can't bake in the fact that the the or- Orioles can go get whoever they want on, on this planet. And I think with the new ownership, they are going to be more aggressive. And I think that when you look at the, the fact that they have to make some of these trades, like they literally have to, because they're going to face a, an unparalleled forty man crunch after this this season with so many of the twenty twenty guys being college guys that are going to be you know Rule Five draft candidates. They're going to have to move them. It's going to be a raise type of, of situation, which is why the raise. That's one of the few times you'll see Rays make trade mistakes is when they wait too long and then their hands are tied in a 40 man crunch and they trade Joe Ryan and Andrew Strotman for uh, Nelson Cruz uh, because they were their hands were tied and the deadline was coming and they were going to have to try to find 40 man space for them at the end of the season anyway. So I think that's an instance here where they're going to be aggressive. They're going to go do something. We've talked about Mason Miller, things like that. Like that's going to just put them over the top potentially. I'll always buy into to what they're doing, and and I just I just think this team is more mature. It was already one of the best teams in, in the league last year in the regular season, and now they're more mature and even a little bit more complete. And the pitching is better. And you added Corbin Burns to this team. Like I, I know that in the past it's they've been hard to to peg and stuff, but I I think sometimes you just don't overthink it. And this team should be one of the favorites, in my opinion. One hundred percent, I agree with you. It's so funny because. The math on the Dodgers always says favorite, and the math on the Orioles always says don't bet on them. And like, I want to bet on the Orioles, and I don't want to bet on the Dodgers. It's one of those things. But overall, of the favorites, the bet that I would recommend, and most likely, I'm I think I'm going to wait a little bit longer because I still think they're going through more struggles right now. And maybe I'll miss my opportunity, but I don't think it's going to change much. I will let you guys all know on my Twitter when I do. But I'm probably going to be adding the Braves to my futures portfolio. But I want to talk about another one. I have a 25 to 1 futures bet and a 50 to 1 futures bet that I think it's important to buy now on. This is the San Diego Padres to win the National League pennant and to win the World Series. I know. Sounds crazy, right? Nobody wants them right now. And now is the time to buy. So Fangraphs gives them a 6% chance to win the NLCS. So just off that projection, the odds should be about a 1,000 points lower. And then in the World Series, it's the same thing. The odds aren't even close. What do I want when I'm looking at a postseason team? I want a monster rotation in the playoffs. Dylan Cease, you Darvish. I know Joe Musgrove has struggled, but again, this is where we find value. We remember how good Joe Musgrove was in the playoffs. If he can right these wrongs, we got another horseman. And we have Michael King, who's also... Still a good pitcher. I know he's had his struggles, but again, finding value. This bullpen is awesome. And with Jeremiah Estrada breaking out, it's getting even better. And they have monsters on offense, and adding Luis Arias adds so much depth. They have Tatis and Machado who can hit the home runs, but they also have these great role players like Jay Cronenworth, like Ha Seong Kim, Jerks and Profar is breaking out. Luis Campisano, I think, is a great catcher. So I look at this team... And then I look at A.J. Preller, who is a maniac, who always wants to make the big splash. He already did it already this season. Why couldn't it be the Padres trade for this guy? And everybody's shocked. Happens all the time. Why I think is the time to buy now, they have a very easy schedule in June. So if they run off a ton of wins in June, you and I both know what A.J. Preller is going to do. He is going to 100% add. And why I think the Padres are showing so much value is I don't love them as a regular season team. I wouldn't even be surprised if they missed the playoffs. And that's the point. Right now, Fangraphs gives them a 54% chance to make the playoffs. If they do, these odds are going to cut in a quarter because we know that the Padres, if they can get hot, can be an incredible team. So what Mm -hmm. I did was I bought Padres to win the pennant at 25 to 1. And I bet Padres to win the World Series at 50 to 1. We wow. have to remember, this is value. Do I think the Padres are better than the Dodgers? No. Did I think the Diamondbacks were better than the Dodgers? No. Did I think the Phillies were better than the Dodgers? No. Did I think the crazy things have happened? It was Diamondbacks versus Rangers. So if you want a long shot right now, I think you got to start investing in the Padres before it's too late. I It's a team I like going into the year. Um, and I know I was the, the high guy on them. And uh, I think the, the odds have, have obviously shifted to make them even further long shots, which is crazy to me because they're, they're a game over 500. And, and if you told me Xander Bogarts would be hurt, 
Fernando Tatis would have an OPS like of 740. Uh, Manny Machado would have an OPS in, in the what is it 600, maybe below that. Uh, you're you're gonna have David Peralta as your DH. Hassan Kim is gonna have an OPS in the in the 680 range, 690 range. Like if you told me all of that, I would say, oh man, like it must be really ugly out of the gate. And there it feels worse, but they're a game over 500. I. Don't know when Bogarts, you know, what that whole deal is, and he might miss most of the season. But the the fact that you can get Machado going, I, I'm he's 32. He's not even 32 yet. Like he's going to be fine. He's coming off of a surgery. I think he's going to get going. Uh, I really feel confident that Hassan Kim in a contract year will get going and start to really roll. Tatis is just too talented to be to be what he has been so far this year. And yeah, he's slugging a little bit, but he, he's got to be better than that. And yes, they've had some breakouts, like a, a pro far, like you said, just, just totally standing on his head so far this year. And Merrill making the leap and, and adding Arias. Those are all great things. But the guys that are supposed to be their stars have, have not really been their stars. And I still think that they will be. Then you mentioned the rotation. And I also think this is a team that is almost the most guaranteed to make an aggressive move because Preller is also kind of working for his job right now. If they don't make the playoffs, I think he gets he becomes on the hot seat. Uh, and I think he knows that. I, I think he realizes that they got to make some waves here or else you know, his, his job security is is you know becomes an issue. There, he doesn't care how he leaves the farm system. He never cared before. Why would he care now when when there's a chance that he might not even be there for it in a year or two if it doesn't go well? I look at the farm system even after the Arise trade. They have guys that could come up and help them also from a pitching perspective. Matt Waldron's been great, but let's say he hits a wall or someone gets hurt. Adam Mazur is a fringe top 100 guy who's been awesome in the upper levels this year. Robbie Snelling was our minor league pitcher of the year last year who could also get up and help them or headline a massive trade. Uh, they've got Dylan Lesko who could headline a big time trade. They've got Graham Pauly who's a really good piece that a lot of teams would be very interested in. I could go on and on and on. Like They've got a lot of good pieces still. Um, and, and so when you look at it from that lens too and how aggressive that they could be there, I just, I guess my question is, where do you think they go? I don't think they go the pitching route. It'd probably That's be another thing. bat and it'd probably be a slugger. I knew you were going to ask that question. Like, how would we know what is in AJ Preller's mind right now? He'll just add Nobody anyone does. he thinks he can find value on. He's almost like the greatest sports better of all time <laughs> in the way where he, he grabs value where he can, right? He trades Juan Soto, but he still wants to have a competitive team. So he trades for Dylan Cease. That's just what he does. So we're talking about the Braves potentially getting Kevin Gosman. If Preller hears that Gosman is on the market, why wouldn't he trade then Dylan Lesko and some prospects for Gosman? Wouldn't that get it done? Yeah. Yeah, they could they could put something. So why together. couldn't he do that? Or why couldn't he trade for the big bat on the market? But then I look at the Padres. Do they need a huge bat? Or do they just need their bats who are already awesome to just start hitting again. That's where I'm looking. Where do you upgrade? I guess you could assume right, that Jerks and Profar. I get you could go get a Tommy Pham, right? Go get a proven postseason hitter like that. That I think is more of the easy part. And then potentially they could go, they could do whatever they want with that farm system and with how AJ Preller knows, like he said, I think you made a great point that he could potentially be in the hot seat. Maybe this is the time that he overpays, but we don't care. Right, we're not talking about the Padres winning in 2029. We're talking about the Padres winning right now. And my last point on them, I thought you asked a great question. Do you really believe this was over text? Do you really believe in the Padres rotation? And I said, I believe that they can get hot. And what I mean by that is if all it takes is a little bit of momentum, and if Dylan Cease is commanding the baseball, you Darvish is doing his regular postseason performances and Joe Musgrove looks more like the postseason Musgrove that we're used to, that's a rotation that can win you a series. And ask yourself, fans of other teams in the National League, do you really want to go up against those three with how good this bullpen has been? That's going to be really, really tough. And then what if they add the big-time pitcher? So that all sounded really, really good. There's a chance this team doesn't make the playoffs. I, I'm serious. Like, yeah. they are not a good regular season team. They just aren't. I don't know what it is. I really don't. They were terrible in one-run games last year, which should revert the luck. So maybe that's going to start happening this year, but it really hasn't. There's just a lethargy when this team goes down, and when they are up, now they're winning those games. But it's like when they're down, there's no comeback in this team. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Maybe in the playoffs it changes, and we've seen that before. 
But that's why it's such a big long shot. And right now, the Padres are a team that nobody really gives a shit about. The Giants are on a good win streak. I don't think either of us believe in them. The Diamondbacks yeah. are last year's World Series, you know, runner up. So they're still going to have a lot of allure to them. People are watching the Cubs and Shota Ibanaga. Cubs are extremely overvalued in the market. That's one yeah, of the most overvalued National League teams. Just based off the projections. Remember, Cubs fans, I'm not coming at you. I'm reading the numbers on the page. And that's what it's telling me is that you guys are just so overvalued. Brewers, properly valued. But I don't think we believe that they're a World Series winning team. I think we believe that they could be a great regular season team because of the Colin Rays of the world where the, he just goes five innings, two runs. And you're like, what? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, we're... the Padres the Padres and Brewers square off in a, in a, in a you know, playoff series. Who's who's the favorite? I, the I guess Padres. it depends on where those teams are trending at that time. But I think a lot of people are going to be picking the Padres in that matchup, even though I love the Brewers. And you know the Padres could take down the Dodgers in the first round? Never know. Of course they you, you could. I, I mean, of course, if they're hot, and especially with Darvish, the way he throws against them. Um, the, two names that I think could be interesting and, and I think would fit is like Taylor Ward. Taylor Ward going to, to San Diego would make a lot of sense. And he has you know another year of control, so that would fit like a glove. I think that would be really fun. And then maybe if they want to go a little bit lesser, a Mark Canna, I think would be another great addition. I think either of those guys could really just – shore up that lineup and then yeah you know, again i think some of their their top prospects could end up filtering in and being being arms for them too and they've got some options that way as well and maybe paulie ends up figuring th- some things out and is ready you know later in the year to contribute as well i think the bench is going to be good I, I still the team's just too talented to count out and i agree like it, it's going to depend on on whether they can sneak into the playoffs but once they sneak in i i think they're cut from that phillies last year's d-backs cloth where they can make that run and we're always trying to identify that team I think this could easily be that team. Were there any more long shots that you were looking into? Because I just really got um, into my Padres. I, I think the Rangers are showing value. The thing I, is, the Rangers just won the World Series, so I'm a little bit hesitant. But I think if you are going to buy, now is a good time to do so. Corey Seager just won Just Baseball's Player of the Week. Dude was on a freaking tear. Like, they're a team. They're going to get back all those pitchers like Scherzer, hopefully DeGrom, Tyler Malley, those guys. So they're enticing to me. I also think that they're going to add at the deadline. Um, I'm still in a conundrum with the Orioles. Like, I want to bet them. <laughs> but it's like my gambling brain is just no. My heart's saying yes. Um, Yankees overvalued. Nobody in the Central excites me. I like the Guardians and the Royals. I just don't see them as World Series teams. Yeah. Um, and the value isn't there either. Nobody in the American League is really jumping out at me, maybe outside of the Rangers. Yeah, I mean, the Rangers just because they have like the Avengers coming back and yeah. it, it might be too late, but I don't think it will be because the Mariners aren't good enough to to create any separation there. I don't know about like the implied probability and, and things like that, but I, I'm I'm going to die on the Twins Hill, too. Like, I just I think it's a good team and mm. I, I, I just I think they could get hot if we're talking about just the teams that I could just if sneak into the playoffs and then get hot. You got Pablo Lopez, you got Joe Ryan, uh, and then, you know, we'll see who the, the third guy can be for them. But, I mean, we've seen Bailey Ober throw really well. I'm not saying I would trust him as, like, the third guy in the postseason, but they could end up going out and making a move. They also have a lot of, of capital themselves. But I just love the lineup, and and I just – with some of the younger guys finally, like, putting it together and, and swinging it so far this year. I mean, Kirilov finally healthy and doing some things. Like, I, it, it seems like every time I start to believe they get hurt again, but they're they're, they're – you know, getting through a really slow start with Pablo Lopez, who he he does that pretty much every every beginning of every year. Uh, I just I, I think the team is talented. I'm, I wouldn't bet it. I don't think, but I just I, I believe in them. No, uh, pot- potentially making a making a move like making a little bit of a run if they get hot and, and having Correa there as well. Like I'm always going to bet on a Carlos Correa led team in the, in the playoffs in terms of just belief. Um, and and with Ryan Jeffers playing like an absolute freak show as well, like they've just got a lot of talent, and, and I could see it coming together. And then we talk about their bullpen, the back end, like it's 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 lights out. I just don't think the Twins are going to make the playoffs. Yeah, it's no. going to be tough for them to make the. That's playoffs. the thing. That's another point of it. It's like the Twins have a better record, but they're twenty nine and twenty four as we sit here today on Tuesday, May twenty eighth. Let's say they're five games over five hundred at the deadline. Are they adding? Mm, they're probably like- doing that a painful like 
Maneuver. small ads, things like yeah. that. It, it, in the National League, it'll be easier to sneak in with the wild card, but in the Definitely. American League, it's going to be a lot tougher. Way tougher. And that's another point about betting. It's like the Twins have a legitimate better record than the Padres, but I think the Padres' path is easier than the Twins' is. And don't you just feel like last year was the year? Like I was I was betting on the Twins in the playoffs. I, it I was going well, the early goings, but that's when they had Sonny Gray. That's when Pablo Lopez was looking so unbelievably great. That's when Joe Ryan was great. That's when their whole bullpen was healthy. That's when Royce Lewis and Carlos Gray and everybody was there. Yep. And they lost to the Astros. And like yep. it wasn't all that close. And I remember no. because I freaking bet on the twins to beat the Astros. And then I that's where I was scarred forever. It's like I could just you just never fade the Astros of the playoffs. You just can't. Yep. And that's another team to keep an eye on, too. But the American League path is just a little bit tougher. Hopefully, everybody enjoyed that conversation. Please let us know. It's too much betting lingo, not enough betting lingo. Let us know in the YouTube comments below. I talked a lot. Now it's time for Arm to talk. <laughs> the prospect report. Arm, who in the minor leagues is uh, kicking ass right now? We got a lot of guys that, that are performing. And it's it's at the point now where we've got some like fresh names. You know, I think some of the guys that were off to like the classical hot starts uh, and, and just we're coming up on a sheet every single week. We've got a little bit more, I think, nuance to it now and, and some newer some newer faces and things like that, which is fun. All right. Well, I'll start with the guy who just got called up to the big league, Spencer Schwellenbach with the Braves just absolutely was shoving uh, prior to getting promoted to the big leagues. I didn't think it would happen that quickly. But when you are basically dominating right away, right out of the gate in double A, 13 innings, no runs, 17 strikeouts and a walk. And you are in the Atlanta Braves organization. They're going to fast track you. And he got fast tracked, but also Hurston Waldrop, first round pick in last year's draft by the Braves as well, has started to really settle in from a command perspective. 19 and a third innings, just three earned runs, 23 strikeouts in double A, only three walks. That That is crazy. Like that's not what I was expecting from him this quickly. So to see that coming along, you know, he's got the freak splitter, can run it up to the upper 90s, nasty slider. Speaking of guys who can run it up to the upper 90s, National League East, probably going to be a guy that's going to end up facing Waldrop a lot. Brandon Sprout, the Mets, another really fun college arm from last year in the draft as well. I think this is a guy that's probably going to be in our top 100 update. I've been so floored by his stuff, and he was a guy that we, we pushed pretty high in the Mets' top prospect list. 19 innings. He is has allowed just four earned runs since getting promoted to, to AA as well. And uh, all of them have come via the solo shot, which is or, or, which is crazy. And, and a lot of those came in Reading, which is uh, one of the more hitter-friendly environments. He's run the fastball up to 100. The slider is also a plus pitch. The changeup is flash plus. Another guy that it was a question of command. Command is there. 20 strikeouts, five walks over the last three starts. Jairo Iriarte, the White Sox. He was included in that Dylan Cease trade. Top 100 guy for us coming into the year. I think one of the more unique stuff in like pitch characteristic guys in the minors. Last two starts, 18 and two-thirds innings in double A. 29 strikeouts and just four walks. Slider is a plus plus pitch. Fastball is a plus pitch from a low release that just rides and runs. And then Tink Hentz, the Cardinals prospect, last two starts has been phenomenal. It's been frustrating because the Cardinals have been so careful with him pitch count wise. They're letting him loose now. Last two starts, 12 innings, nine hits, two earned runs, 22 strikeouts and three walks. But most importantly, he's thrown, I believe it's 203 pitches over his last two outings which we had never really seen him get stretched out to 90 plus pitches and back-to-back -back outings like that. Before I switch over to the hitters, one other pitcher that's just been awesome. Marlins first rounder, top prep arm in the draft. Noble Meyer just got promoted to high A, Beloit. Final two starts in, in low A, 10 innings, two hits, one run, 19 strikeouts and seven walks. The other guy, funky release, crazy fastball, disgusting slider. Uh, and then we've got some fun hitters that are performing as well. James Wood I'm getting bored, and I'm sure yeah, he's getting I mean, bored of it. He's like, on it dude, every like, week. He's, he's going to be week. on it every week until they call yeah. him up. Last 10 yeah. games, 400, 550, 667 slash line. He's even walking more than he strikes out by two times. 10 walks, five strikeouts, two home runs, five strikeouts and 40 plate appearances. We're talking about a 6'7 guy who had hit tool questions and now is striking out five times and 40 plate appearances, and he's still not getting called up to a team that could definitely use him. It, it is incredibly frustrating. Um Tyron Lorenzo, we're talking about the Dodgers, 
Here's another trade ship for the Dodgers. A uh, 20-year-old catcher who they might want to hold on to, and they might trade somebody else instead. Started really slow. One of my favorite breakout guys coming into this year, though, and he's starting to really get rolling now. The last 10 games, an OPS over 1,000. He's walked eight times. Six extra base hits has just been awesome. Speaking of trade chips, Dylan Beavers. He's basically hit at every stop and just has been so steady since the beginning of, or really the second half of last year. Orioles have a guy here that they will probably be able to move in, in packages and could get them. Uh, it could be a part of a, a really impactful package with some of the other guys we we're talking about. But last 11 games, OPS over a thousand, seven extra base hits, four home runs. It's even mixed in two stolen bases. PCA hasn't slowed down since being sent back down to AAA. Had the most iconic home run we talked about it the other day that I've seen in a while. But beyond that, 12 hits in six games since being optioned down. Four doubles, three homers, five for five in the stolen base department. And then one of my favorite guys to watch when he connects, John Kenty Noel, Cleveland Guardians. He is so aggressive, but he also hits balls 114 miles an hour. He's only 22 in AAA, so I'm going to be patient with him. But 40% chase rate is frustrating. He cut that chase rate to like 35% over the last like two weeks. And over that stretch... 326, 408, 628 slash line, four home runs. So that guy's been awesome as well. And then two more twins bats that I just I really love. Emmanuel Rodriguez, we pushed him pretty high in the preseason top 100. People were concerned about a 30% strikeout rate last year in high A. And now in double A, he's maintained like a 28% strikeout rate. He's just going to do that at every stop. He's like Edward Julian, but if you put him in center field, and by the way, he's playing a good center field. Last 11 games, 389, 551, 833 slash line, four home runs, seven driven in, 13 walks, and just nine strikeouts. He's very patient. He's running a chase rate, I believe, of like 10% this year, um, but is, is more aggressive in the right spots, hits the living crap out of the ball. And then his org mate and now teammate, Luke Keyshaw, who... I think was one of the steals of the draft last year, made some mechanical adjustments that I love, just got promoted up to double A. They're still trying to figure out where he's going to play defensively. He's a really good athlete, just funky arm action, still trying to figure that out. He was an all-state wrestler in high school. So he's just a, a unique guy, but he can just hit. 447, 526, 766 slash line over his last 12 games. He's added some power since he made some mechanical adjustments, four home runs, eight walks, just five strikeouts, three for three in the stolen base department. And, and, I think he's going to continue to, to hit at the double-A level. I really like what he's got going on. And sorry, I just remembered one more because he's going to be on the call-up this week. Trey Morgan, the smoothest field and first baseman out there in the Rays organization. You might remember him with, from LSU. He's playing a little bit of outfield now, too. He just got promoted uh, to high A, I believe. Last 10 games, 447, 553, 737 slash line, eight doubles, a home run, eight walks, only one strikeout. In his last 48 plate appearances, excited to have Trey Morgan on the call up uh, this week. So look out for that episode. I love the prospect report because I just sit here and I just learn. And I hope everybody learned too because arm, that was awesome. Hope we got it covered. World Series odds, prospect report, Angel Hernandez and Corbin Carroll arm. This felt like a banger of an episode. And if you Hell thought yeah. so, could you leave us five stars? That's all we ask. Just five stars. It's a click of a button on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And if you would be so kind to leave a written review, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. And if you want to go a step further, Just Baseball merch is in the episode description. We got Don't it all. Stop. We got it all. We need the rope hats on. We need them. When do we get those no. in? They're, they just got in. So we we just have to, I think, update the store and they're they're ready to go. So be on the lookout for the rope hats in our merch store. And of course, support our partners. Game time. Anybody want tickets? $20 in the episode description. That's a uh, discount code if you use code just baseball, as well as on BetMGM, of course, that no sweat first bet offer. Get on it, folks. If you liked anything that we talked about or a team that we didn't talk about, no sweat first bet. Might as well get after it. For Arm Lane, I'm Peter Apple. And for actually, I was about to end the show. For all college baseball fans, preview tomorrow, Pete Flaherty. Myself, Jack McMullen, get ready for it. But with that, thank you, everybody.